From a and this is Biography. Cadbury Company in Bourneville, England has been turning out rivers of chocolate for nearly 200 years. Most people say uh, well, that must be the best job in the world, making chocolate. Can't think of anything better, really. You weren't obviously supposed to eat the chocolate. When you first start, you eat tons of the stuff. I think you'll find very few people who work within Cadbury dislike chocolate. They let people have their fill and then they didn't really want any more. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Four generations of this Quaker family built a dynasty based on chocolate. Their recipe for success combined a unique set of ingredients, hard work, clever marketing, innovation, and a Quaker belief in doing good. There has never been a chocolate company like Cadbury but over time, their very success has changed their nature, just as they have changed the history of chocolate. Cadbury's sweet dreams began in England in the 19th century, a land poised between two eras. Ahead lay the Industrial Revolution, behind an ancient past of royal privilege. The king and queen were also the heads of the Church of England. When the Quakers broke off from the main church in 1656, they became political and social outcasts. We were excluded from the university, excluded from the professions, excluded from any offices under the crown and so on. So that trade was a very natural outlet. Quakers tended to go into business because they were excluded from um, many other areas. The Quaker philosophy was that they had to work hard. There was a, what you might call the Protestant work ethic, which was at its most marked amongst nonconformists, such as the Quakers. So they were very hardworking, they were very focused, and the Quakers in particular wanted to do their business in honourable ways that were imbued with Christian values. John Cadbury, the founder of the Cadbury Chocolate Dynasty, was born in 1801 into a deeply religious Quaker family. Young Quaker men like John were commonly shepherded into a trade, and at 16, John Cadbury went to London to apprentice in a business that was quintessentially English, selling tea. In 1824, after seven years of paying his dues, hawking tea for others, John set up his own tea and coffee shop with a gift from his father. But how can a new kid on the block separate himself from the rest of the tea-selling crowd? By selling cocoa on the side. In the 19th century, chocolate was still a liquid. The solid chocolate bar we can't say no to today was yet to be invented. In the early part of the 1800s, and in fact for almost 4,000 years that chocolate was first known to man, um, it was not something that, that looked or tasted anything like what we have as chocolate today. What chocolate was back then was nothing more than the cocoa bean that had been cooked and then ground and crushed and then added into um, some kind of liquid. Cocoa had been in Europe since the Spanish conqueror Cortes brought back the cocoa bean from Mexico in the 16th century, unleashing a treat that would fatten us up for centuries to come. The drink was thick and bitter and had to be sweetened with sugar or honey. It was an expensive luxury. People believed that it was uh, something that they uh, should, should have. It was considered better than tea and uh, people of uh, stature, politicians, social groups, uh, thought it was trendy. Little by little, word of chocolate's extraordinary taste leaked out. And John Cadbury designed his business to grow with the demand. 
the 30-year-old Cadbury began to concoct his own cocoa drinks, and before long, he relegated tea to the sidelines. Cadbury next rented a small factory in the center of Birmingham and took out newspaper ads to promote the health benefits of his wickedly rich cocoa potion. John Cadbury is desirous of introducing to particular notice cocoa nibs, prepared by himself, an article affording a most nutritious beverage for breakfast. Chocolate was seen as giving strength to people, as um, in enhancing uh, your virility, uh, making you a better lover, being able to cure all sorts of ills from migraine headaches to gout um, to hysteria. It wasn't just nutritious, but it had all these healthful properties. The healthfulness of chocolate was important to John. As a Quaker, he had an obligation to improve the lot of his fellow man. The product that you manufacture, if you're a good Quaker, has to be a quality product. Uh, it cannot be junk food. Uh, it, it cannot be an inferior. It cannot be superfluous or useless uh, or trivial. And if people don't know about it, they can't buy it. John knew that promoting his product was all important. His store had plate glass windows so that passers-by could see the treats inside. In England in the early 1800s, there were two types of windows, the kind of windows that we would see today, and the old-fashioned greenish and kind of ribbed windows that were almost opaque, you could hardly see through them. John Cadbury had a clear window, and he had sugar cones, and he filled the window with attractive, eye-catching features, and it was an exciting thing to go past his window. John worked tirelessly, and his business grew. The 31-year-old did have one distraction, however, her name was Candia Barrow. He met her in 1832, and the two fell in love and married that year. Over the next 13 years, the couple had six children, evidence, perhaps, that chocolate is an inducement to love. It wasn't just John's family that was expanding, though Cadbury had competitors like Fry and Sons, who were also Quakers. John's little chocolate shop kept growing until Cadbury owned a factory with 200 employees. In 1847, he brought in his brother, Benjamin, to help him run the business. The Cadbury brothers were now brewing up 16 kinds of drinking chocolate with names like Churchman's Chocolate, Breakfast Cocoa, and the irresistible Iceland Moss. John was building a fortune, a drink at a time. But all around him in bustling Birmingham was bleakness and misery, the underside of the Industrial Revolution. As a Quaker, he felt a duty to help the poor of his hometown with his growing wealth. He began by cleaning up life for the chimney sweeps, young boys who risked their lives to clean chimneys for pennies. John Cadbury was worried about the, the plight of the small boys that cleaned the chimneys, and uh, he was able to do something to try and improve their lot as well. By the 1850s, John had made great progress toward ending the dangerous practice, which was eventually banned by an act of parliament. And that's a crucial feature of the Cadbury family. Not only did they make money, but they tried to give some of it back to Birmingham and to the people of Birmingham. 49-year-old John's fortunes were tied to chocolate, but now his fortunes took a turn downward. By 1850, thanks to the worsening English economy, the import tax on cocoa spiked upward. The high cost made it difficult for the company to turn a profit. The struggle was the fact that there was the duty was still quite high, that the business was really finding it difficult to pay, and at times they just felt like it wasn't worth carrying on. Then in 1855, John Cadbury's wife, Candia, died from tuberculosis. He never fully recovered from the loss. Soon after, he became ill with rheumatic fever that sapped him of his trademark energy and concentration. Beset by high import duties and with a failing leader, the business began to decline. John's sons, Richard and George Cadbury, were only 25 and 21 years old. 
In 1861, they took over from their ailing father. They'd been working in the factory since their teens, but they had never had this level of responsibility. Could these children of privilege succeed in turning the company around? What they'd inherited was hardly a success story. Their father's company, that once had 200 employees, now had fewer than 20. The sweet smell of success had turned bitter. It would take more than hard work and Quaker values to bring the company back to life. It would take a whole new way of making chocolate. In 1861, a second generation of Cadbury's, Richard and George, had been handed a company that was on the verge of ruin. You've got two men running the company who are utterly determined to make a success of it, who are honest and who are honorable. Keeping with the Quaker belief in learning, Richard and George had received a solid education at Quaker schools, where they were encouraged to discuss ideas freely and think for themselves. 25-year-old Richard was the intellectual. He painted, traveled, and studied natural history. 21-year-old George was the perfect Quaker, sober, grounded and devoted to helping Birmingham's poor. He woke early every Sunday morning to teach reading and writing in the city slums. My grandfather certainly mainly used um, the Bible as the, as the basis of the classes. It was really to teach people to read and write. And it was simply that actually was a sort of good, you know, good starting point that you added religion in as well. Richard and George threw themselves into saving the company, which had shrunk to 11 employees. They arrived at seven and left at nine each day. George wouldn't even permit himself the expense of tea, coffee, or newspapers until he'd turned the business around. Their hard work kept the company alive, but it still was not flourishing. Richard and George felt they could pull ahead of the competition if only they could put out a better product. At the time, chocolate left a lot to be desired, like taste. It was a very bitter drink. It was very um, heavy. It had all the cocoa um, ingredients in there, so the cocoa butter and the cocoa powder. And it was actually almost difficult to digest. To cut the fatty taste, Cadbury had always added filler like potato starch and molasses. It was a minor addition, considering that their competitors were adding iron oxide and brick dust to stretch the expensive cocoa. But George thought he knew of a way to eliminate the need for any filler. He had heard of a new machine in Holland called the Van Houten Press that could squeeze out the fatty cocoa butter, leaving pure cocoa behind. George was determined to bring the new machine to England. In 1865, with the last of his family inheritance, he set sail for Holland. George later wrote in a letter home, Without knowing a word of Dutch, I saw the manufacturer with whom I had to talk entirely by signs and a dictionary and bought the machine. It was by prompt action such as this that my brother and I made our business. The Cadburys weren't just prompt, they were unusually well informed. They knew what was going on around the world because they were well educated, and this knowledge set them apart from their competitors. The Quakers highly valued education, and the Cadburys were extraordinarily well educated and very well read, and therefore they were able to be slightly ahead of the curve when it came to doing something first, to picking up on, on a manufacturing process that had been perfected elsewhere, and then bringing that to England. With their new machine, George and Richard began to transform chocolate in England. Their chocolate wasn't thick and bitter anymore. It was smooth and mild, and it contained no filler. Richard called it Cocoa Essence and advertised it as absolutely pure, therefore best. The Dutch press created a chocolate drink much easier to stomach. Cocoa Essence was a sensational success. It marked the turning point for Cadbury. Cadbury's really had a lock on the British market for a while there because certainly there were other competitors, but they were the first to start pressing out their cocoa to make this pure essence of cocoa. 
To market their products, Richard thought up a then novel idea of putting pictures on the outside that looked as pure as the chocolate on the inside. My great uncle Richard um, was the first person to think of putting uh, pictures on chocolate boxes. Being of an economical turn of mind, he painted the pictures himself, used his own family as models, and produced some absolutely splendid chocolate box uh, labels. The brothers advertised everywhere. The picturesque Cadbury ads were considered so striking that newspapers wrote articles about them. In effect, more free advertising for Cadbury. Richard is really the artist of the family, the man who starts to draw the way they're going to do their advertising. And George is the man who, who's really running the business in many respects. But the two of them have got wonderful talents and skills, and they bring them together. Cocoa Essence propelled Cadbury from the 30th to one of the biggest chocolate manufacturers in England. In just a few years, the company swelled to over 200 employees again. Now Cadbury would need a whole new factory. Building a new factory wasn't just a necessity for George. It was an opportunity to radically improve the lives of his workers. In Victorian England, life for factory workers was like a chapter out of Charles Dickens. They worked over 12 hours a day, six days a week, with unsafe machinery, and then went home to cramped cold quarters with no heat or running water. George Cadbury wanted to change that. He said, through my experience among the back streets of Birmingham, I have been brought to the conclusion that it is impossible to raise a nation morally, physically, and spiritually in such surroundings. But if each man could have his own house, a large garden to cultivate in healthy surroundings, then there will be a better opportunity of a happy family life. Grandfather had always had this uh, uh, vision uh, of uh, having a workplace uh, where, in fact, the, you were out in the open country, you know, to feel they weren't sort of shut in in the center of the city and get away from the smoke and the dirt and everything else. The new Cadbury site was located four miles outside of Birmingham between a railroad connection and a stream called the Bourne. The brothers named it Bourneville because French chocolates were considered the finest in the world and a little borrowed cachet couldn't hurt. It was wide open territory and they could build everything from scratch, um, but also because the air was fresh and pure and clean and again because of their concern for their workers they wanted to have um, to provide them with things that you couldn't find in the city. Richard and George envisioned Bourneville as more than just a place where their employees could live. It would be a Quaker utopia for workers. The reason why the Cadbury's invested in this kind of a uh, uh, community was certainly motivated largely by the Quaker conviction that workers must be treated to meet their needs and to meet them generously and to provide them with security and shelter and some of the amenities of life. Every couple of houses looked different. There were different appearances to the fronts, then there were nice gardens out the back and places where you could grow vegetables. Now, that was part of the philosophy of the Cadbury brothers, that it was the whole man and woman that they were looking at, the mind, the body, and the soul. Richard and George's chocolate village was dotted with swimming pools and playing fields, dining rooms and lounges on the factory grounds. Workers could join sports teams, and in keeping with their own belief in education, the Cadbury brothers encouraged men and women to go to night school. The cynic could say, well, if you treat them well, then they'll work harder, and of course there's some truth in that. But I don't think that is basically what originally motivated them. The reason for Bourneville was to improve the conditions of poverty of the ordinary factory workers. But if the Cadburys built the town, they also made its rules. There would be no alcohol, and George even brought in a temperance speaker to lecture the employees. Single women were given jobs, some with authority, but George felt a married woman's place was in the home.
Men and women were treated rather separately. Certainly when the women got married, they were not allowed to work there anymore. They all had to leave. And they were usually presented with a Bible and a carnation when they, when they left to get married. Still, the chocolate kings commanded fierce loyalty from their workers. It wasn't unusual for several generations of the same family to work at the company because Cadbury treated them all so well. They treated themselves well, too. Both Richard and George lived in manors staffed by teams of servants, and they ran their houses by their Quaker beliefs. My mother came up to work at the manor where George Cadbury lived, I think probably a kitchen maid or something like that, in 1896. And um, I remember she said that he called them, called all the servants, his children, and he held a prayer meeting every morning uh, for, at which everybody had to attend. The homes were also overrun with Richard and George's families. Naturally, as they grew older, a few of their children would inherit the Cadbury chocolate gene. Richard's sons, Barrow and William, went into administration and engineering. George's son, Edward, went into the export department, and George Jr. concentrated on manufacturing. In 1899, while traveling in Egypt at the age of 63, Richard contracted diphtheria and died. His brother George became chairman of the board, and Barrow, William, Edward, and George Jr. became managing directors. It would be up to this third generation of Cadbury's to turn cocoa from something you drink into something everyone loved to eat. Throughout the 19th century, drinking chocolate had been growing more popular, but eating chocolate was another matter. It was hard to manufacture and tasted gritty and bitter. Think of, of the darkest chocolate you've ever tasted and kind of double that intensity of the flavor and you have a sense for what the first eating chocolate was like. The solution to the problem was not a mystery. If milk could be mixed into the chocolate, it would cut the bitterness. The question was, how to do it? Chocolate is 70% fat, milk is 70% water. Blending them was literally mixing oil and water. The elusive code for creating milk chocolate was finally cracked by a Swiss chemist, Henri Nestle. Nestle used a drier, condensed milk to overcome the problem of combining fat and water. In 1887, the Swiss began selling a milk chocolate bar. The new chocolate was smoother, milder, and more delicious than anything on the market, and every chocolate maker wanted to figure out Nestle's secret. The Nestle company comes out with this milk chocolate, and of course, everyone in England wanted to find a way to make milk chocolate, and there was this mad race on for people to, um, to find a way to do this. There was no one in England who wanted to learn the secret to making milk chocolate more than young George Cadbury Jr. He had inherited not just his father's name, but his passion for innovation. George tried everything, from endless trial and error to sending spies to Switzerland. In 1897, Cadbury was ready, or so they thought. They put out a milk chocolate created by mixing sugar and milk powder with cocoa and cocoa butter. It was the wrong approach. The chocolate was coarse and dry, and the public hated it. Cadbury's first milk chocolate was a dismal failure. They made a not terribly good milk chocolate in uh, 1897 using powdered milk, but they realized that that quality wasn't good enough. Finally, after years of milk formulas gone awry, Cadbury's chemist created their own milk chocolate that used fresh milk, not powdered milk like the Swiss. In 1905, Dairy Milk, Cadbury's milk chocolate, was born. It wasn't really until 1905 when Cadbury started working with actual liquid full cream milk that we came up with the recipe. 
And that really was an innovation and something that you couldn't find anywhere else on the market. Milk chocolate was to George Cadbury Jr. what the Model T was to Henry Ford. It was all George Jr. could think about. He even wanted to build a new factory that could produce 25 tons of his new chocolate a week. But his cousins, Barrow and William, and his brother Edward, did not share George's rich appetite since they had failed once with milk chocolate already. Their Quaker thrift made them doubly cautious about investing in dairy milk. Cousin William took the view that um, milk chocolate wouldn't really sell. Because the board were divided about whether milk chocolate really take off, they cut Uncle George's plan right back. Dairy milk went on the market in 1905 with a brilliant advertising campaign. Dairy milk, it said, was not nearly as good as, but better than foreign milk chocolate, with a glass and a half of milk in each bar. To the surprise of everyone but George, the product took off and Dairy Milk soon became Britain's best-selling chocolate bar. Uncle George was right, and they had no sooner really started selling it than they had to um, uh, not only get back to his 25 tons a week, but expand a good way beyond that. The public ate up Cadbury's Dairy Milk, and the rest of the chocolate industry could not duplicate it. The recipe for Dairy Milk was and remains one of the biggest secrets in the chocolate business. The recipe itself for Cadbury's Dairy Milk is kept under lock and key here in Bourneville in a safe and there are perhaps only about half a dozen people alive today who know the recipe and it's passed on from generation to generation so it is a very keenly guarded secret. Now that Cadbury unlocked the secret to milk chocolate, everyone else in the business wanted it and would stop at nothing to get it. You had spies uh, from one factory uh, going to try to get jobs at another factory. Everybody knew what the ingredients were. You just didn't know how people were handling those ingredients and that's what made the difference. The Cadbury Company wasn't above using friends in high places to edge out the competition. The family had connections in Parliament and allegedly arranged to have their American competitor, Forrest Mars, kicked out of the country. The 1920s had arrived. In Italy, Mussolini formed his fascist party. In America, Fats Waller and Louis Armstrong were trumpeting in the Jazz Age. In Egypt, King Tut's tomb had been discovered. And in England, the Cadbury Company was nearing its century mark. George Cadbury was honored by the King of England for his efforts. But it would be the end of one era and the beginning of the next for Cadbury. In October of 1922, George died at the age of 82. His nephew, William, took over as chairman. William decided he would leave his mark on the company by concentrating on what was inside the chocolates. He pushed for machines that allowed Cadbury to put different fillings inside chocolate bars. By the 1930s, Cadbury was launching the products that would make them successful for decades. Crunchy, fruit and nut, milk tray, and roses. Cadbury's high quality chocolates were becoming an English institution. When Monty Python later did a sketch on investigating a Cadbury rival, everyone got the joke. Am I right in thinking there's a real frog in here? We use only the finest baby frogs, dew-picked and flown from Iraq, cleansed in the finest quality spring water, lightly killed and then sealed in a succulent Swiss quintuple smooth treble cream milk chocolate envelope and lovingly frosted with glucose. This is maybe it's still a frog. Oh, what else? <laughs> well, don't you even take the bones out? If we took the bones out, it wouldn't be crunchy, would it? <laughs> William Cadbury never attempted amphibious confectionery, but his most successful innovation was the famous cream egg, a chocolate egg with white and yellow cream filling inside. When they developed cream eggs, it was unique, and, and they had not only the brand, they had the method of making it. They developed the technology for that, they built the machines themselves. They developed a factory within a factory in Bourneville. They could make virtually any sort of equipment, which kept, gave them a, a really big um, lead over the competition. Cadbury rolled along smoothly until World War II. When the war broke out, 
Hitler was poised right across the English Channel and had Britain in his sights. Many British companies were retooled and pressed into operation to manufacture goods for the war effort. But the Cadburys were Quakers, and Quakers are pacifists. The Cadburys refused to make armaments or lend their name to war materials. Instead, William, the chairman, opened up a separate company called Bourneville Utilities that made support equipment like gas masks. Cadbury also continued to make chocolate, which received an unprecedented boost from World War II. Among soldiers, consumption reached 50 pounds a year, three times the pre-war average. Chocolate went into the war as a, a food for the troops, um, and it came back from the war with um, a reputation for giving people energy and also a real acceptance, and it became seen as an energetic food, something you could eat um, to build muscle, to, to build your strength. Before the war, chocolate was child's play. After the war, men and women ate as much candy as children did. Chocolate was becoming an item for mass consumption. The market for it was bigger than ever and worldwide. Now Cadbury faced a new challenge, becoming a global company. From now on, their competition wouldn't be local. It would be the Swiss and American giants, Nestle, Mars, and Hershey. Their Quaker traditions would be put to the test, and so would the company itself. Most family companies don't last past the third generation. The question was, would Cadbury? Cadbury's of Bonville, makers of the famous dairy milk chocolate. The nearly 200-year-old Cadbury Company entered the second half of the 20th century in a very modern way, with television commercials. Ah, good morning, good morning. Good morning. And you, Mr. Dillon? Oh, yes, of course. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good idiot. Why don't you carry your milk like this? There really is a glass and a half of rich, creamy milk in every half pound of dairy milk chocolate made by Cadbury's. The ads were the latest in the long Cadbury tradition of marketing that went back to founder John Cadbury's 19th century glass window display. Commercial television advertising started in this country in 1955, and I think one of the first ads was a Cadbury ad. Um, and that's really representative of uh, our determination and drive to be in there right at the start with any new media. Cadbury advertising has sort of driven the, the success of the company throughout the second half of the 20th century. What's the time? It's chocolate time. It's chocolate time. Time for Cadbury's drinking chocolate. But if the emphasis on advertising had not changed, the Cadbury family itself had. The fourth generation had grown used to success and its rewards. No longer were young, coddled Cadburys interested in the business that was the source of their fortune. Some members of the new generation were going into government, others the family newspaper business, and still others were dilettantes. But one young Cadbury was a throwback to the chocolate pioneers who had built the company. Adrian Cadbury was fascinated by the family firm. In 1943, while still in his teens, Adrian started working at Cadbury, learning the business from the factory floor up. The first day he came in, he said to us, what do we do? So we said, well, it's quarter to eight in the morning. There's the tea can, and the tea point is down the corridor. Great, he said, and for three months he fetched our tea. When not fetching tea, Adrian attended college. When he graduated from Cambridge, there was no question in his mind what he had to do. So in 1952, Adrian joined the family firm. The Cadbury Company was nearly 130 years old and produced over 1,000 tons of chocolate a week. Who ate it? Well, by 1956, Cadbury had expanded into the obvious markets, Europe and former British colonies in India, Africa, Canada, and Australia. But the real challenges, the communist world and the United States had yet to be tempted 
by Cadbury's chocolate. 17 years and millions of chocolates from his first day on the job, Adrian became managing director of Cadbury, a 19th century business and a 20th century world. The company was weighed down by slow moving management and a time honored policy of nepotism. One thing was certain, and that was always that blood is thicker than water. Anybody who went to work for the Cadbury firm knew that if their last name wasn't Cadbury, there was only so far that they could go in the company. This rather archaic kind of, kind of organization was not the way to get the bright young people that we needed to get in from, 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 from university, for example, to come and uh, uh, you know, undertake a career here. It was a major challenge, in a sense, to sort of move to a modern form of organization. The biggest challenge facing Adrian was the instability of the cocoa markets. Like coffee bean prices, the cost of importing cocoa beans could fluctuate. When prices would soar, profits would sink. Adrian's solution was to take Cadbury public which would give the company a needed infusion of capital. There comes a time when there's pressure from even just from within the family that there should be an open market for their shares. In 1962, Adrian started trading shares in Cadbury on the stock market. Cadbury was now a publicly owned corporation. It would be shareholders, not family members, who would be calling the shots. If they had a bad year, in the past, they'd say, oh dear, what a pity, we must try and do better next year. But of course, that didn't work when, they were, when there were shareholders. We continued, I suspect, for a few years, still treating it as if it was entirely our business. Uh, and then <laughs> um, uh, we gradually you know, accepted that we got a much wider body of shareholders to, um, uh, to uh, 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 keep contented and to serve. Life did become a little bit more uh, earnest, if you know what I mean, a little bit more fraught and results just had to be produced. The immediate result of going public was that millions of dollars were pumped into the company. But for Adrian, the results were far more personal. There are still family links, there are still family shareholders, but really at that point in particular, we, we've ceased to become a, a family firm. By taking the company public, Adrian forfeited the benevolent and grandfatherly management style of Cadbury. Now shareholders would demand an unquaker-like return on their investment. For nearly two centuries, Cadbury fortunes had depended on the ever-changing cocoa markets. But if Adrian could diversify the product line, he could protect Cadbury against swings in the price of cocoa beans. He went on an ambitious campaign to create some very unchocolate like products. They got into instant milk, instant potato, they bought a meat company uh, that did canned meats, um, and along with that came a wine company. Uh, so they were getting this sort of conglomerate um, of food alongside the confection business. Uh, and in a way, um, they were interfering with each other. Cadbury was synonymous with chocolate, and none of the new products caught on with the public. But Adrian was determined to expand and sell more than just sweets. So he merged with a company that sold something else. In 1969, Cadbury merged with Schweppes, the makers of drink mixers. Although Cadbury workers would lose their jobs, the business logic was overwhelming. Both Cadbury and Schweppes had international potential, but separately they didn't really have either the financial or managerial resources to develop their businesses around the world. So it really was, in fact, a very good fit, uh, and that was the logic of the merger. Everything that had identified Cadbury for hundreds of years was shifting. It wasn't a family firm, it wasn't a chocolate firm, and it wasn't a Quaker firm. The difference is almost frightening. Tonic water by you know who. Don't forget Schweppes was a drinks company, a drinks, mixer drinks. They were into, uh, that was their industry. They were in the, 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 this is a Quaker company, don't forget, by background. So merging with Schweppes was quite something. That marked a real change. 
uh, Ford Cadbury, and many people say that the firm really has never been the same um, since that period in time, that the soft drink side of the business um, really started to run the chocolate side of the business. The merger meant big changes, not just at the factory, but at Cadbury's fanciful candy village of Bourneville. Today, I think you'll find people come and go. Um, a lot of people that will live on Bourneville now obviously don't work at the works, and that's sad to see the things disappearing, like Roheath, a lot of the football fields and uh, racetracks, running tracks. They've got houses built on them now and things like this. But time marches on. Time marched on at Cadbury as well. The company had replaced workers with machines and trimmed back fringe benefits to compete with its giant rivals, Mars and Nestle. The numbers on the bottom line had gotten bigger. The numbers on the assembly line, smaller. When I started, there were 12,000 people here. Uh, there's now in the region of about 3,000 people. And most of that change is as a result of technology because the volume has probably increased tenfold uh, at Bourneville uh, to what it was like 30 years ago. We actually make a lot more chocolate. In 1990, next to where George and Richard Cadbury had envisioned their workers' utopia, Cadbury Schweppes opened a kind of Disney World for chocolate, a theme park called Cadbury World. The company was changing, and in 1989, Adrian retired, to be followed by his younger brother, Dominic. Dominic kept Cadbury Schweppes going in the same international direction, setting his sights on America. Under him, the company acquired American beverages like 7-Up, Hawaiian Punch, and Dr. Pepper. Dominic figured the best way to beat the competition was to join them and hired Hershey to make Cadbury chocolate in the United States. In May of 2000, Dominic Cadbury reached the mandatory retirement age of 60 and left the firm. He would be the last Cadbury to lead the company. The Cadburys had literally modernized themselves out of existence. But much of what the Cadbury family built has remained. Bourneville, George Cadbury's monument to the Quaker belief in doing good, continues to exist as a reminder of the past and an inspiration to the future. There's always someone on the green that you know from the past or the present or whatever, and you can have a chat with, and someone will start talking about the old days or the old times or whatever, and the village community is still there. I think for the Cadburys, there was no other way to run a business. They, they were what they were, which were uh, several generations of Quakers with uh, very strong principles, and uh, there wasn't any way they could go against their principles, and um, so they didn't have discussions about whether they should do it some other way. Cadbury had lived through several eras, adapting to new times while managing to stay true to itself. The Cadbury family today has no connection to the company other than their famous name but that name will always be part of the history of chocolate, and their legacy is carried on millions of times a day whenever someone bites into a Cadbury chocolate bar. Yummy. <laughs>